In 1984, a student solved every problem on an elite university's entrance exam. The examiners noticed. They even admitted his preparation was excellent. But they refused to let him answer. Not because he was wrong, but because his name revealed his ethnicity. A few years later, that same student completed a PhD at Harvard in a single year and went on to help shape one of the most ambitious ideas in modern mathematics, a framework that suggests many of math's deepest fields may actually be one and the same. This isn't just a story about rejection. This is the story of Edward Frankel, the mathematician who turned rejection into freedom. The 1960s in Russia were an ethnically turbulent time. Though the war was long done, its after-effects lingered and would take many more decades to completely wear off. In such a time, in Kolomna, a small provincial town near Moscow, was born a child named Edward Frenkel. His father was Jewish and his mother was Russian. Right from childhood, Frenkel showed exceptional academic brilliance. Initially, he was drawn towards quantum physics. By the time Frankel was 16, a local mathematician named Evgeny Evgenievich Petrov, Frankel's first mentor, recognized the gifted child's potential and began coaching him in higher mathematics at the local auditorium late into the night, piquing Frankel's interest in mathematics. In the summer of 1984, Frankel decided to apply to Moscow State University, MGU, the Soviet Union's elite academic institution. He had prepared intensely, but he ran into a problem that he couldn't foresee. His name revealed his ethnicity, and the Moscow State University did not admit Jews. In fact, they made it almost impossible for a Jew to gain admission, even if they were academically far more brilliant than the other applicants, which Frenkel was. Jewish candidates had to score 18 points, while other candidates would gain admission at 15 points. The exams themselves were infamously referred to as the gas chamber by members of the Jewish community, a dark invocation to the Holocaust. But on July 13, 1984, Frankel decided to appear for the examination anyway. All day, he kept solving the problems asked by examiners and kept raising his hand to answer, but they wouldn't let him answer. Disappointed, he left the room, but not before his examiners grudgingly complimented him saying his preparation was excellent. With Moscow State closed to him, Frankel's father drove him the next morning to Petrochemical and Natural Gas, nicknamed Kerasinka University. It was a second-tier institution, but it accepted gifted Jewish candidates who couldn't gain admissions in top universities. Kerasinka became a refuge for young Jewish mathematicians. Frankel enrolled in the Applied Mathematics program, but the deepest maths was at MGU. So Frankel and his friends did something remarkable. They illegally attended lectures at MGU. They climbed unguarded fences, flashed their Kerasinka IDs at the gates, carefully timed entrances via less guarded entrances. Crucially, many of the mathematicians at Moscow State, who knew of this injustice, welcomed them. Among these mathematicians were Frankel's next mentors, Dmitry Fuchs and Boris Feigen. One day, Fuchs gave Frankel a research paper and told him to call him if there was something he didn't understand. Frankel understood almost everything and called once he was through. Thus began his research career. By his second year as an undergraduate, Frankel had already written and published his first research paper, that too in Israel Gelfand's legendary journal, Functional Analysis and Applications. Gelfand was a giant of 20th century mathematics and he was now aware of Frankel. By 1989, the Soviet Union was beginning to unravel under perestroika. The Berlin Wall had fallen, the Iron Curtain was lifting. Western institutions raced to recruit the brightest Soviet minds before they could scatter. Recognizing opportunity, 
Harvard University's mathematics department put together a list of bright young Soviet mathematicians. They invited several on their radar for research visits, and Frenkel was one of the chosen ones. This invitation was extended even before Frenkel had completed his undergraduate degree. Picture a 21-year-old young man from Kerasinka, who just a few years ago was illegally climbing fences to attend lectures, now heading to what was considered to be the world's best university for mathematicians, while his country crumbled. At the same institution where Einstein once taught, a place where his Jewish identity was no longer an obstacle, a place where brilliance was celebrated. Edward Frenkel went to Harvard University in 1989 as a visiting scholar and enrolled as a graduate student in 1990. His advisors were Boris Feigen, who had clandestinely helped Frenkel attend Moscow University classes earlier, and Joseph Bernstein, a legendary figure in representation theory. Frenkel also got to work closely with Vladimir Drinfeld, a Russian mathematician of the first rank, whose work Frenkel had studies by candlelight back in Moscow. Finding Feigen and Drinfeld as official mentors was an absolutely stunning moment. For the first time, Frenkel was celebrated rather than be excluded. From here on, Frenkel's career took a miraculous turn. Finding an environment in which he could shine, Frenkel completed his PhD in a single year. Imagine a student who Moscow State University wouldn't admit, finishing a PhD in a single year in the world's preeminent university. In 1991, his dissertation on spectral curves contained original contributions to representation theory. With that, at the age of 23, he held a doctorate from Harvard. This wasn't just speed. This was a vindication that the institution back in Russia, which had called him unworthy of taking their entrance exam, was catastrophically wrong. The average time for a PhD at Harvard was about five years or even more, with coursework, qualifying exams, dissertation and research. That Frenkel was able to compress all of that into 12 months and still produced original contributions was phenomenal. From 1991-1994, he was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, one of the highest honors a mathematician can receive. From 1994 to 1997, he was an associate professor at Harvard. In 1997, at the ripe old age of 29, he moved to UC Berkeley as a professor. From his research days of the early 1990s and intensifying through his career, Frankel devoted himself to a single grand vision, the Langlands program. Imagine if mathematics had its own theory of everything. As Einstein had dreamed of a single equation to explain gravity, electromagnetism and quantum forces, Robert Langlands proposed something equally audacious for mathematics. This is known as the Langlands program. Robert Langlands, an unassuming Canadian mathematician, wrote a 17-page handwritten letter in 1967 to André Weil, one of the 20th century's most brilliant minds. In that letter, Langlands suggested the impossible. What if the hardest problems in number theory, like the study of prime numbers and their mysterious patterns, could be solved using tools from geometry? What if representation theory, how abstract symmetries act on spaces and algebraic geometry were secretly the same thing, just viewed from different angles? What if all the disparate languages of mathematics were dialects of a single underlying truth? For 57 years, this seemed almost mystical. Most mathematicians thought it too ambitious. Frenkel, however, saw it differently. He called it the grand unified theory of mathematics, a framework that reveals hidden connections between fields that appear unrelated, just as quantum mechanics revealed that electricity and magnetism were two sides of the same coin. This wasn't abstract theory to Frenkel, it was personal. The Soviet system had taught him that truth shouldn't be gatekept. The Langlands program promised something radical, that beneath mathematics surface chaos lay elegant, unbreakable unity. If proven, it would reveal that seemingly disconnected fields, number theory's primes, geometry's curves, algebra's symmetries, were all secretly speaking the same language. 
Frankel saw this as mathematics' ultimate act of liberation, revealing hidden connections no human authority could suppress. Frankel's contributions to this program were substantial. With various collaborators, he proved the geometric Langlands conjecture for GLN, a major milestone that had remained open for decades. He developed the Feigen Frankel Center, a structure central to modern representation theory. Frankel then collaborated with Edward Witten, one of the world's greatest theoretical physicists, to show connections between the Langlands program and quantum field theory. He also established the analytic Langlands correspondence, a novel framework extending the program to new settings. In 2002, Frankel received the prestigious Hermann Weyl Prize in mathematical physics. He was the prize's first recipient. In 2014, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. After 30 years of cumulative work by dozens of mathematicians, including Frankel, in 2024, the true vindication of the Langlands program came through Dennis Geitzgori and his collaborators finally proving the geometric Langlands conjecture. It built directly on the foundational work Frankel had done with Kari Vilonen and others. Geitzgori won the 2025 Breakthrough Prize in Mathematics for this achievement, the highest honor in the field. But everyone knew that this triumph rested on insights planned by Frankel in the 1990s. But we've only covered one facet of our genius so far in our story today. Frankel was not only a genius research mathematician, he was also a public intellectual and an artist. In 2013, alongside his mathematical research, Frankel published Love and Math, the heart of hidden reality. His book was about the love of mathematics itself, about a passionate commitment that drives a person to spend years pursuing an abstract idea without any guaranteed payoff. The book became a New York Times bestseller and won the 2015 Euler Book Prize. It has been translated into over 20 languages so far and has been a bestseller in Japan, Spain, China, Brazil, France and other countries. A mathematics book becoming a bestseller in all these countries was unprecedented. Frankel did what few can. He made the abstract universal. Millions who would never touch an equation found in his words a shared human experience. The thrill of discovering something true, something beautiful, something eternal. In 2010, Frankel co-directed and starred in a short film titled Rites of Love and Math, a homage to Yukio Mishima's Rite of Love and Death. The film premiered at various international film festivals and was featured in publications including Science and The New Scientist. In recent years, Frankel launched Aftermath, a YouTube series that serves as a companion to love and math. He has yet another avatar named DJ Moonstein, under which he produces electronic music, continuing Pythagoras' legacy of uniting mathematics with music. Even his music carries this philosophy. As DJ Moonstein, Frankel creates electronic tracks that blend mathematical precision with emotional resonance, echoing Pythagoras who first discovered that musical intervals correspond to simple mathematical ratios. For Frankel, this isn't coincidence. It is proof that the same mathematical beauty that unified number theory and geometry also unified rhythm and harmony. Truth speaks through every medium if we learn to listen. Why would a top mathematician write books, make films and spin records? The answer returns us to Frankel's origins he understood something most academics miss, that mathematics isn't a sterile puzzle for isolated geniuses. It is alive, a language through which reality speaks. Mathematics is as beautiful as music, as profound as poetry, and most importantly, mathematics is freedom itself. Frankel has often stated that, where there is no math, there is no freedom. Frankel's story isn't just about a talented mathematician overcoming obstacles. It is about mathematics as a form of liberation, as a way of accessing a reality that no state can control, as a language that speaks across cultures and across time, and as a form of human development that cannot be diminished by prejudices, as it is built on a logical necessity rather than on an opinion. 